Hello and welcome everybody and welcome back to those who have joined one of our previous power sessions. Um, thank you for joining us in our today's session, uh, Smart Buildings Impact on Security Megatrends. My name is Mariam. Um, you should know me from the, from the previous session and I will be guiding you through today's session. Um, before we start, as usual, here are some um, housekeeping rules. So just so you know, you are all uh, muted, but uh, and the session will be recorded. Um, you can ask the questions uh, in the chat. If you look at your control panel, you should see um, um, one box that is called chat. If you click on it, you can just type in any questions that you have. We will gather them and then we will have a Q&A session with our experts at the end. And try to dedicate it to answer all of your questions. Um, also, one thing that is important to me that we have a survey at the end of the webinar. So after we have closed, um, there will be a window popping up asking you for your opinion. And it would be really great if you can leave a feedback for us so that we can improve our sessions for the future. Um, so yeah, let's just get started directly with our today's speakers. Um, we are very, very excited that we have um, Harry from Accenture today as our guest speaker. Harry is the UK and Europe lead for Accenture's intelligent workspace offering. He is responsible for co-creating future employee workplace experience across multiple clients, developing thought leadership and designing technology that powers the workplace of tomorrow. So welcome, Harry, and thank you again for joining us today and giving us your um, expert view on this topic. Um, from our side, from Johnson, Mariana uh, Duarte, who is our Smart Buildings and Digital Solutions Manager, leading the Smart Buildings and Digital Solutions area for continental Europe. Um, she has over 23, 23 years of experience in the automation and building technology markets with outstanding leadership on how technology supports the global megatrend challenges. So welcome to you also, Mariana. And last but not least, um, Horst is with us again today. Um, he's our security solutions manager for Johnson Controls in the DACH region. And since 2018 with Johnson Controls, working with country leaders regarding security strategy and enablement. Um, before that, he worked at ADT Security. Oh, I guess we Security have some... for 14 years in the USA and various sales development roles. And he's joining us from Vienna today. So welcome. Thanks also for joining us. I'm going to give you a quick uh, overview of our agenda today. So we will start with Mariana and Horst, who are going to talk about smart buildings and security megatrends, as the um, title indicates. Then we'll jump over to Harry with IoT, um, which is not a cybersecurity risk, it's critical to the future of workplace. Um, and then back to Mariana again for additional perspectives of smart building solutions. And as said, at the end of the um, session, we will have a Q&A part where we can answer your questions. But before we start and jump into the topic, we would like to get your opinion again and have um, Paul, um, that we would like you to answer us um, one question um, from the technologies like video surveillance, access control, visitor management, building management system, and um, uh, etc. How do you judge your systems are implemented nowadays? Um, you can just click any of the answers that are provided. So either it's not integrated at all, you have some integration like CCTV or access control, but visitor management, for example, not. It is partially integrated, so you have CCTV, access control, visitor management, and so on, but no BMS. Um, you have all integrated, so all the systems are integrated into and interoperable, or you have a full smart building already and use advanced cloud solutions with AI to monitor um and um, add value to your business so please feel free to click any answer that is 
responding the most to you and then we'll have an overview of what results we're getting in. Okay, so we see that um, most of you have partially integrated already and 25% um, have some integration, also a few with, with all integrated and 17% with full smart building. So thank you very much for giving us an overview of um, the maturity of this. And without further ado, I would say let's Jump into the session. I'll hand over to Mariana. Ariane, can I move my the slides? Yeah, you're okay. You're on. <laughs> I'm just wondering if I can move the slides. What is not working? Yes, yeah, so um, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Don't, know, re don't really know where you're logging in, but it's a pleasure to be here with you together with uh, uh, Horst to be discussing with you on the smart buildings and the security megatrends and how technology can support answering some of your challenges. Um, I would like to start with uh, one. Uh, just, just give us a second, Maria. Can you move it, or I'm trying to, but then it jumped back. I'll, I'll try again. Just a second. Yeah, I clicked it, so it should be working now. Okay, so I would like to start our discussion today by giving you one figure that I think it's quite interesting and we, um, we don't re really stop to think about it. According to the World Health Organization, we spend 90% of our time indoors, being it on a, on a residential or a non-residential building. That means it's a lot of time in, in a building. So when we think about quality of life, we have to automatically relate that to the, the building and what a building can actually provide us. Buildings have different purposes. They are places for us to live or to work. They could be um, places where we, they could be places where we um, have uh, learning or healing, we can do shopping, entertainment uh, venues, um, they can be specialized sites. So there is actually um, a, a huge variety of purposes for the building, but they are central in our lives. So let's look now of why are we talking about security and why would that be so important when discussing this whole uh, environment? At the moment, there, there is a lot of changes in the environment where we live. Um, with the pandemic, for instance, something that we was never thought of before, health became a very important and crucial topic. Um, with the lack of resources that we have, the climate change uh, conditions, um, the recent wars that we've, we are seeing, um, sustainability and energy efficiency became very, very important topics as well. With another interesting point is with the new generation being born connected. Um, so the amount of uh, uh, data that is available, information that is available and the speed of data exchange completely transformed the environment that we are living in. And with that, the expectations towards our living environment 
is changing a lot. So when we think about business continuity, um, asset protection and people's safety, security must be in the core of it. Um, according to the um, Security Industry Association, there is a list of 10 megatrends that um, if you saw our previous presentation, won't go away. They are very, very uh, hot topics at the moment. It goes from artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, all the way down to workforce development, data privacy, and um, last but not least, combining the outcomes of uh, uh, security and operations efficiency with health and health and sustainability. So we would be looking into this uh, environment when bringing uh, up to you now discussions about how technology in a building can support all those challenges that we are facing at the moment. So if we look from the building perspective, we have buildings that have loads of systems implemented. You have a data network in place, we have a power management in place, video surveillance, fire alarm systems, HVAC control systems, and so on. So when thinking about this building, um, it is a very complex environment. You have multiple technologies in a building. You have old and new coexisting and you have a lot of different communication protocols. So if you think about it, it could very much look like this. Um, now, my question is, what, what are the things that we are looking at based on those challenges that we were just discussing? When, like in our companies, we are thinking about uh, uh, people retention or user satisfaction when thinking about customers visiting our buildings. Um, we are talking about improvement of internal processes, product, productive security breaches um, or management, uh, energy consumption and optimization plan for our company. So these are outcomes that if we try to evaluate all those data in a separate business, uh, uh, in a se separate systems or in the separate systems that we have available in the building, it becomes very complex. So what we need to do is to make sure that these systems talk to each other and they are interoperable. So they would be actually bring to you outcomes that would make our life easier inside the building. So we would be talking about integrating HVAC security, building access control, intrusion systems, lighting, elevators, electrical power, parking controls, and so on. When we have that all integrated, we can bring those data analyzed in a manner that it's easy for us to understand where and what and how we should do to improve the living or, 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 or the life of the people within the building. Okay, that's quite interesting. And, and we're looking within a building, what the amount of data and, and, and the amount of systems we have within the building. But if we think about current situation, more and more we want that building to consider some external information to be able to leverage from this data. So we, are, we were first talking about making the systems talk to each other within the building and, and, and then analyzing those big data that uh, was available. But now we're bringing in a new component, which is let's leverage from the available data from the outside of the building. So we can have weather information, we can have information from the police, or the firefighter, real-time information that can be considered by uh, your, your system within a building. And with that, bring some intelligence to it. I would like to invite Horst to talk a little bit more about it. Horst, over to you. Thank you, Mariana. And I should be able to take over the slide, right? I would think. Yeah. 
So, you know, talking about artificial intelligence, you know, with this large amount of data coming from these various systems that Mariana mentioned, you know, and even also outside data included now, it's impossible to be handled on the spot quickly by individuals. You know, artificial intelligence that is built into all these components takes this incoming data, filters it, analyzes it, finds patterns, responds, and creates automated alerts and actions. So this process leads to much higher efficiency and, and processes within the building. AI you know, built into the edge devices, um, you know, things like detectors, cameras, you know, even readers or thermostats into the server or in the cloud even. So with that broader concept of, of you know, we hear about deep learning, machine learning, it leads to new information, more intelligent, safer, cheaper, faster decision-making. Um, let's see here, the slide. So the example is, you know, the advancement, for example, of, of facial authentication, you know, especially with AI built in, has proven during COVID to require, you know, COVID situation, you know, has proven itself with many of these touchless solutions. Situational awareness, critical, can lead to drastically improved response rates and uh, prevention of escalations. You know, do, you, do you want to be alerted to a potentially critical situation as it happens or days or weeks later? So this AI helps mitigate risk, reduce false alarms, predictive maintenance, uh, even foresee potential breaches in the future. And, and it really helps with uh, additional building efficiencies. All right, there we go. So this brings us to this, um, next part of, of megatrends, which is tightly related uh, because all this data collection and use of data, you know, really brings up the topic of data privacy. You know, it's building operators. You can tell now how many people um, actually are in a building and their behavior. You know, the, the potentially personal information, PII or, or personal identifiable information. So this, the Data Privacy Act, you know, must be considered and built into design uh, in the process uh, just to ensure compliance. You know, with the constant looming of cyber threats, you know, there's an example here, it shows in a slide, you know, up to 83% you know, of organizations have experienced breaches over the last two to three years. The responsibility to shield and mask this privacy data is large and those threats are always growing. So just consider the potential for claims going even as high as 4% of total annual revenue worldwide. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty crazy if you think about that. So this pressure requires cyber and data security as the core component of product and platform development. Threats are coming from all levels, you know, from IT, various operational systems via the edge, even some uh, even IT devices, you know, connected apps via the user practice, etc. There are many entry doors. So while the building life cycle, you know, as as you can see, you know, usually around three to 30 to 50 years in comparison, the internal technologies, you know, they're running much, much shorter life cycles. They require much more frequent actions to stay up to date. So modernizing legacy systems, up-to-date software support agreements, you know, et cetera, allow for the most up-to-date status for data security and data privacy. So managing this risk involves really proactive monitoring of systems and verification steps built in into the processes, the hardware, software applications, and, and access, et cetera, internal and external. So just a, these are just a few examples. You know, smart integrated system and solutions need proactive cybersecurity policy as part of this building and management infrastructure. And uh, data, you know, data privacy is just one part of it. So protection of private data, as mentioned, you know, protecting this private data or business data trade secrets, internal proprietary information takes a comp comprehensive approach. And when it comes to cloud-based solutions, you know, they're growing for many reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is that the cloud platform service provider has a critical stake in keeping cybersecurity uh, up to date, taking on the risk and work and the constant updates and maintenance, the know-how, the qualifications, manpower, you know, by, you know, handled by the cloud service provider versus the local building operator really is invaluable. You know, then it comes to some internal embedded systems like you know, zero trust networks that's embedded in the process. Basically it requires that every system, every entity to have permission to access this data. So there's no trust without that authentication. 
network monitoring uh, systems, monitoring data flow from entire buildings, uh, from field networks, from the enterprise IT, et cetera, identifying any threats, traffic variations, component malfunctioning. You know, it's it's key part to a comprehensive attack. And then lastly, you know, the ongoing or choosing the right global cybersecurity partners is certainly another level from you know, from a global threat uh, aspect. You know, another level of experts basically who's, who specialize and provide consultancy and compliance and, and audits um, just to keep a high level of, of, of cyber protection of their privacy data and also of certifying being um, you know, the enterprise. So, so with that, I'm going to hand this over to Harry um, from Accenture, who's going to give us um, his perspective of, of the workplace future. So here we go, Harry. And Harry, unfortunately, is not on video as the camera doesn't work. So, <laughs> yeah, technical issues. Thank you, Horst. Yes. Good to be here with you all. Good to be here with you all today. So, what I'd um, what I'd like to do is take you on a bit of a journey through why the workplace matters why IoT matters because of the workplace and the value concerns that we do have around security, best practices, and how to negotiate those. So I'll just try and progress to the next slide. So I want you first to imagine what does the building of the future look like? So if we can for a moment start thinking around, we have a corporate mobile app and in the morning, you get directed to an available parking spot. As soon as you exit your car, you get a notification that one of your colleagues is going to be in the office today and they're going to be located on this floor. Would you like to book a desk next to them? Your phone grants you biometrically authenticated and seamless access to the office. And then once you get to your collaboration space or meeting room, you can then adjust the room temperature uh, to your desired setting. As you move throughout the building throughout the day, the signage is customized to you. You get notifications, whether that's from events or menus from the cafeteria to prompt you and nudge you along your way and as you move throughout that building you get proactive alerts so maybe you have a bit of extra time before your next meeting you could take the long way around for example or if you're running short on time it can give you the fastest path to your next meeting the idea to make this as frictionless seamless and as easy to use as possible um, when you arrive into your meeting space you're automatically logged into your video call you don't have to spend time wasting time dialing everyone in trying to get the screen share working etc and as you finish your last meeting you get reminded where your car's been parked and you also um, get prompted do you need to reserve a desk again to more, for tomorrow which maybe you will simply because you notice that two of your colleagues have actually booked space so again bringing um, colleagues together i think what we want to do is really paint that picture of does your building experience today actually deliver this the answer in the vast majority of cases is no. So when people come to us and ask, well, how do we get people back into the office? You have to build a world-class workplace experience. And IoT and data, um, as Horst and Marina were talking about in their previous session, is absolutely critical to doing this. So I think it's really important to level set around why IoT is critical before we get into the fact that there are some valid security risks, but those can all be mitigated. So just to play that back again, the way we see the, what has traditionally been known as digital workplace is now very much split across three different towers, workforce, workspace, workplace. Workforce being typically the remit of HR, human resources, workspace being the remit of um, real estate and facilities, and workplace being predominantly an IT function. What we've realized now is that individually those teams have run you know, excellent projects, but they've never really come together before. And coming together and being able to leverage data from your HR platforms, your Office 365, your G Suite platforms, all the way into existing systems within buildings, whether that's IoT sensors, the building management system, having that aggregation and abstraction layer to bring it all together and make it coherent and drive intelligence off the back of it is critical. That's how we're going to build the smart offices and the smart buildings in the future. And being able to make that seamless and easy for colleagues to come back and hang out with each other and collaborate is going to be the number one reason people choose to come to the office beyond 2022. So it is absolutely critical that organizations understand this problem set 
and how to negotiate and navigate around. What I'll share with you very briefly is a bit of a, a brief case study, what we did at our um, headquarters in One Manhattan West. Some of you may may not have been there um, at the time. So when it was commissioned um, about two years ago, it was the largest well platinum certified building in the US and I believe 12 times the size of the next largest one. It was the first 5G enabled skyscraper in North America and I believe globally as well. And it was also LEED Gold certified and contained the, mo the largest number of um, AV enabled hybrid meeting rooms globally, I believe still does, still does to this day. And the reason I want to talk through this and not just show you some nice pictures is what Manhattan West became a case study for, we know how to design good looking aesthetic offices, but where we really had to change our, um, change our approach was how do we connect everything? How do we make sure that the visitor management process is seamless? How do I know what the air quality is like in these different meeting rooms so I can nudge um, colleagues, visitors, occupants into different places that's going to be the best place possible for their meeting to collaborate. So a lot of that comes down to we led this as very much a um, world first in trying to achieve this type of um, experience within the office. And what I will say is that I think we met the brief 80 to 85 percent of the time. But the beauty of it is we actually installed all the infrastructure in the building that will enable it not just to be a world class building in 2021 and 2022, but all the way into the 2030s, because now that we've put the right um, components in, whether it's IoT sensors, edge computing, um, the, C the advanced CCTV system, this stuff can all be upgraded over time. And using software can effectively add new use cases as they become available. Technology matures. So just jumping ahead to something I think often gets lost in the in the mix when we talk about IoT. There is no such thing as a one size fits all. In terms of why we want to gather data, if you take a look at the diagram on the right hand side, you can see that you've got an amalgamation of tons of different sources, whether it's your Wi Fi access points, it's your room booking system, it's your CCTV, your lighting, Bluetooth beacons, as an example. Each of these data sets is very powerful in and of themselves, but it only really becomes coherent when you join it all together. So collecting that data and pulling it into a single location is what we call a tier one activity. It's data collection is aggregation. Tier two is actually getting the data scientist to take a closer look and asking, what is the data telling us? And then tier three is, how do we actually make better decisions with this data? So a really great example is what we've done at our Madrid office recently, where we've used um, data from the air quality sensors to figure out that there were actually issues with the building's HVAC system. And that's helped us save not only a lot of energy, but implement some predictive maintenance protocols that has also saved us um, further money and kept the building with greater uptime. But ultimately where, where this is going is that we're actually going to be able to, over time using artificial intelligence and machine learning, automate a, a number of these activities. And a lot of this within Brownfield Estate is going to be driven through IoT sensors. IoT is absolutely critical to getting data, not just in modern buildings, but especially of old buildings where not everything is sensorized. How can I pull, for example, data from legacy elevators? How can I pull it from um, meeting rooms where the BMS um, doesn't have the capability to measure every single you know, data point in a room as an example? We can use IoT to build this expansive mesh network, effectively the nervous system of the building. And we can pull that data back into a, a single brain um, effectively. So what does that effectively look like? So if we look at that bottom row, inputs, everything we've just talked about, CO2, air quality, occupancy, your AV system, BMS, et cetera, you want to pull all these systems together. And the reason you want to aggregate them into an orchestration layer, which is, for want of a better word, a digital twin of your building or your estate, what this allows you to do is instead of building old um, hard-coded links between each of those individual systems, so. A really great example is we have a use case in our buildings where if the CO2 reaches a certain threshold, we can flash up a notification in the room and say, you know, CO2 is reached above a thousand parts per million. We recommend you move to the build the room next door, as an example. Now, that could that could be done in the old world, but it would require very expensive and time-consuming integrations between your uh, building management system, your room reservation system, your audio visual system. But nowadays, using a rules-based digital twin, we can load all the data into that orchestration layer and then using some fairly low code rules, um, play it out and ultimately enable those smart building use cases and capabilities, which is everything you see on the top and more. So you know, 
sustainability enhancements, contextual signage, smart meeting rooms, um, and deep um, analytics and insight. So I think it goes without saying that, yes, that there are absolutely valid concerns around IoT security. And just to jump into a bit of an architecture diagram around what does this actually mean, there's effectively four critical areas where um, you know, effectively security vectors are attacked. So there's the device layer, the network layer, software layer, and the data layer, which we'll jump into on the next slide. But to level set everyone's understanding around how typical IoT systems uh, work, and obviously we could talk at length for this, but in a nutshell, you have your devices, which are usually connect by a very low bandwidth protocol. So what you're seeing here on the, um, on the left, the IoT mesh network, this backhauls to the gateway device, and then usually that goes across either a cellular network or a corporate network, and we'll talk about best practices on the next slide, and then traverses the internet to a digital twin, a IoT operating system, effectively. Now, the data can either be housed internally or in the cloud, but I think it's important to appreciate that the data needs to be accessed by multiple different actors. Facilities need it, employees need it to make better decisions around, say, where to locate themselves, um, real HR might need it. So effectively, you've got to take telemetry from devices, give it a sense of storytelling, and then play it back to users in a way that's effective. Do you give it to them via you know, Teams? Do you give it to them via a mobile app, via a dashboard? Everyone has a different um, requirement for that data. But a good way of thinking about how we address all these different concerns that are there, and just to, I think, talk about the one that's often most discussed, which is obviously data privacy. It's about finding the right sensor for the right job. So if you want to understand occupancy, it doesn't mean you need to violate people's privacy. What you need to understand is, what am I trying to measure? And what's the cheapest, most cost-effective and scalable way to secure that data? So a really good example is, we started off placing IoT um, ceiling sensors in our meeting rooms because we wanted to get an understanding of how many people are there? Are we exceeding capacity, et cetera? And that was particularly important during COVID. What then became apparent to us is that as the technology matured, particularly with modern um, audiovisual systems, we can use the people counting, the edge compute within the AV system to do the people counting. So nowadays we don't need um, the ceiling based sensors. And this is a good example about how if you make the system modularized, you can minimize the security risk, but you can also make it very easy to um, take out and replace as new, better technology. So in terms of best practices and core principles for how we look at implementing IoT systems, and I think a really good way is we'll go from the bottom up in this case. A good way to think about it is kind of the traditional um, OSI network model, everything from the physical layer all the way through to the application layer. So when we talk about IoT devices, we always think about the hardware at the start. It's the small sensor under your desk or on the wall or in the ceiling. We have to make sure that those devices um, are penetration tested, that they have the right security certificates, and that also, and this is where we start getting um, into the depths of things, we have to make sure they're connected to the network in such a way that they can't invoke an external connection. Something that continuously worries network and security teams is when IoT devices can actually invoke a connection from inside the network I'm sorry, from outside the network in, so your hardware management platform, et cetera, having control of that. So you've got to make the, sure the device is physically secured within your building, and then you have to understand, am I going to run it via battery or mains power? What are the implications of doing that from a you know, potential security perspective? But also, how am I going to connect it? Now, a lot of IoT systems have been implemented, and I think it's fair to say these have been done fairly quick and dirty where they've used cellular gateways, and these are great for proof of concepts, by the way. But if you're going to implement enterprise IoT, you ideally want to be using some kind of power of Ethernet gateway or existing kind of wireless LAN, um, wireless VLAN that's dedicated for IoT data. And that's something we work with a lot of clients to actually build and develop. I think moving a couple of levels up, when we think about the network and to talk about that dedicated VLAN, which is really critical, because what it effectively allows us to do is completely segment our IoT telemetry from everything else we need across the estate, whether that's managed devices such as laptops, um, you know, predominantly internet bound equipment such as the Microsoft Teams room as an example, but it allows us to segment that data. Now, the other thing we always have to be concerned about is 
how do you actually connect to the network? And here it's much more about the, it's less about the technology, it's much more about the organizational processes. How do we um, review you know, a network impact assessment? If I want to onboard a new device, how do I get that approved? How do I raise that request? How do I provide, for example, the MAC address so I can easily connect it to the network securely and no one else can just come and plug in a random, potentially dangerous IoT device. So there's a lot of operational processes and controls that go into this. Um, moving a, a level above, we then need to consider what are the enterprise standards within your organization for IoT device communication? You, never, you don't want too many gateways. And this is why building an elegant IoT architecture is often complicated. You want to make sure you're not using 10 different IoT devices with 10 different gateways. You want to simplify around as few gateways as possible. And then obviously we have your standard um, protocols, HTTPS, MQTT, which of these are standards within your organization, which of these are approved patterns. And this is why usually there is a long roadmap and lots of pre-existing work that needs to be done prior to you actually rolling out an enterprise level IoT system that effectively different business units can then consume. I think sometimes we get too focused on, we're going to set up an IoT network that's great for the building and, or the office. But what we also need to appreciate is that Many of the organizations we work within and work for don't just have corporate real estate, they've got manufacturing, distribution plants, um, research and development facilities. And these all have subtly different IoT requirements, but there are standards that we can implement. And it's something that IT and largely real estate need to work together very closely to achieve to make sure that different business units can then effectively leverage IoT as a, as a service basically to enable them to uh, compete. Moving a level above, so looking at the application and presentation layer, then it's key to understand what kind of systems are you looking to implement? What kind of data do you need? How do you want to surface it back to your users? Is it just a simple Power BI dashboard or do you need some more complicated rules-based logic? Is that data being encrypted in transit or just at rest, as an example? And making sure that all these different um, layers are considered as you implement your IoT system is how we look to effectively address what is essentially a large number of cybersecurity risks, but we then mitigate them using this uh, framework effectively. Awesome. No, thank you very much for taking taking your time. I'll now pass back to Mariana. Thank you, Harry. Amazing overview that you gave on with some uh, user case use cases that would allow us to understand a little bit of, you know, all of that data analytics that we were talking about and why that should be implemented. And we will talk further about, you know, uh, about it uh, till the end of the presentation. Um, but amazing. Thank you for the collaboration at, at, at this moment. Um, I would like to bring you an additional perspective of a smart building solution. And with that, um, let me see if the mouse is working. Uh, yeah, uh, another, another side of, of uh, technology and solutions and how it has been done in the past and how it's moving, it's, it's about the solution model. I mean, we all know that in the past, we would talk very much about a huge investment that was needed if you needed some technology to be in place. So normally you would buy a license and behind, behind the license you would have a, a, a whole bunch of hidden costs um, regarding the hardware, the power, the cooling, the real estate to allow that entire solution to, to be implementable in, in, in your uh, uh, company. So physical security and so on. So more and more now we are, and, and, and uh, Harry just mentioned it on the, in, the, in, the, in the presentation, we're shifting that type of solution to a different one. We would be now talking about uh, leasing licenses at the cloud. Uh, we heard some, some perspectives of it uh, from, uh, from Harry and now, when thinking about costing an investment of that of, of this uh, uh, solution, I think it's interesting to say that um, right now we would be um, looking at a subscription price that would cover 
that provide that service and you would have a transparent view of all the costs that would be behind because basically as you having it a lot more and for, uh, uh, and as a service you would not be focusing on buying products and putting them together and, and maintaining them for a long time but you are actually buying a service um, and uh, what you need to have on top of your license pricing it would be your IT support uh, headcounts and uh, training costs these are the let's say the main costs related to something like that so we would be talking a lot more about as a service and with that there are three interesting perspectives that we should consider that this solution model brings to you there is the financial aspect um, with the financial aspect you change for having from from having to have a huge investment to a low initial investment and you would be talking about shifting capex to opex so basically i'm not talking anymore about a system that would allow my building to be operative as a capex but i would put that cost on my opex so that would allow my my costs to be um, allocated also on the right place and with a with a as a service uh, model you have long-term investment protection because you have a leader providing you a service that gets always updated and it's always um, uh, the state of art so that you have it from the financial perspective when we look at the te technology perspective um, i just mentioned you always have the state of the art solution and more than that we just heard from harry about security and cybersecurity. With that, you have a 24-7 um, uh, security threat management with experts monitoring your system and, and, and allowing that security to happen and to be in place. That would mean a lot more uptime, uh, even during difficult uh, uh, situations or bad times. The other perspective that one should consider is also the human perspective. And that is related to one of the megatrends we saw at the beginning and one of the challenges that the industry has, which is to find right technical people that would be supporting uh, the security uh, um, aspect of, of, of the buildings. Um, so with that solution, I am um, in need of less local manpower on premise so i would support those workforce challenges that that we see we have a better end-to-end -end, end user and operator experience for instance i'll just give a very uh, simple example when we install in our homes those uh, cameras to monitor you know the outskirts and how everything is is happening inside the house or if even if i want to see my dog and if the dog is fine and this type of thing you normally can see it from your phone we can have a parallel solution and you can think about that being implemented on an enterprise and and you can have flexibility for your operators to access it from different uh, from from different locations so you don't have to have the conventional way of you know um, having the guards accessing it only locally um, so yeah, so these are the three main perspectives that we would see um, from this solution map model that we see as well as a shift and as a trend. So more and more we are talking about as a service, as a model solution for a smart building. Another thing is that I would like to bring to your attention is regarding the, the outcomes of a uh, a smart building. So we talked now about um, asset protection, we talked about business continuity, we talked about people's safety, which is one perspective of how the technology can support you. But you, you also heard from uh, Harry that, for instance, air quality inside the building is interest. It's interesting. Or um, we use, uh, we would use um, uh, enterprise manager to monitor energy consumption and potential savings and things like that. So 
when thinking about putting data together and making the analytics of all that data, we can expect three outcomes to come out together. We can expect user experience and safety as one of them, sustainability with energy, uh, energy reduction potentials and uh, carbon footprint reduction as a second outcome. And obviously, we could have operational excellence as a third outcome. So these are actually all integrated together. We just have to, we just have to put all those that data working for us under one system that would allow you to have the whole analytics of that. With that, I want to invite you to have a quick view on how Johnson Control C our um, view on smart buildings with a small video that would show you um, the way we see the smart building solution. So, yes, um, Marian, yeah. There are buildings, and there are buildings of the future, powered by next generation open blue technology. Let me explain. Take a look at this place. A seal from this company means the people who work and visit here know the building managers take health and safety seriously. Now let's take a closer look. The first thing to spot is this place is touch free, so no door handles to push or buttons to press. The receptionist issues me a Bluetooth enabled visitor badge, an elegant way to manage and monitor my journey through the building. Yep. I'm told my meeting room is ready and the people I'm meeting know I'm here. Before I even get there, the building is a step ahead. Security and reception are told when I'm expected, my meeting room is booked, the temperature and air quality are checked. Even when my meeting is over and I leave, the building will know. Impressive. So I really feel like things here are under control, that the building is smart, connected. Over there is a massive monitor showing indoor air quality, security, sustainability measures, and other info. Green means good, and the air does feel fresher. That's because this building has a healthy flow of air that's well ventilated and filtered. In fact, the weather outside is something the building actually tracks, automatically changing the settings inside so that everything feels just right. Hey look, these are the people I'm here to see. Now the building management system steps in and guides us to the right meeting room. Just as we enter, the clever energy saving lighting comes to life. The room is ready and there's coffee brewing. All of this technology makes me feel like I stepped into the future. I notice there's a high efficiency air purifier in the corner. The room feels welcoming and fresh and I breathe easier knowing extra clean air is being pumped into the space. The whole place feels safe, comfortable, and inviting. What a building. People who work in the building also have an app on their devices that lets them book a clean space that's ready to use and is safely away from others. Pretty neat, really. And over there, through the secure doors, is the facilities office. It's like a nerve center where important information from all over the building flows. Everything from room booking, security settings, access records, temperature settings, even down to how many steps people are taking to get from one place to another and figuring out how to improve movement efficiency. Here, they're constantly monitoring everything with remote security, fire and HVAC systems working away behind the scenes. Shooting the breeze with the building manager, I discovered their advanced security systems help them make quick decisions in real time. Truly amazing. But I wonder if this is all just a fad, a knee-jerk reaction to the last few years? Turns out, it's quite the opposite. The way the HVAC and energy systems are managed means that the building is costing a lot less to run and is using fewer resources to do it, all the while ensuring the air is clean and the spaces are safe. Healthy, secure, sustainable buildings enabled by OpenBlue aren't just for now. They're the next big thing, making workplaces more dynamic, smarter, bringing together connected solutions for healthy people, healthy places, and a healthy planet. Boosting productivity, increasing profitability, and enhancing sustainability. 
while making the people who work there feel more comfortable, safer, and more in control. With all this safe space and clean, fresh air, you might say I'm a big fan. To see how you can work with Johnson Controls to bring healthy, safe, and sustainable buildings into your enterprise, search Open Blue. Johnson Controls, the power behind your mission. Great, I think we're back. So uh, I, we are going. Uh, yes. Just before the the pool, a few words uh, to finalize. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, that that video gave you a little bit of a, a an overview of uh, how the systems and solutions that we implement um, look and uh, what we can offer. Um, all the, the the topics that were discussed today, um, it's it's the core of our business, and we will be more than happy to discuss with you um, further on um, on how to support your uh, your challenges. Over to you, Marianne. Thank you. So before we go over to our uh, Q and A session, we would like to have uh, another poll and get your uh, opinion again. So it's uh, the same procedure as before. You will see a window popping up with the question, uh, with current changes on the environment around us and the new challenges discussed today, and in order to assure people's safety and business continuity, how likely are you to invest in smart building solutions in the future? So as before, you can just choose what, whichever um, response is um, applicable for you. So zero to six months, I have current ongoing projects. Six to 18 months, I have plans to start discussions in the near future. Um, one and a half to three years, I need to understand more the added value of it, but I think it will be one of my priorities soon. Or you are not planning it at all and um, not convinced yet of the added value of smart building solutions. Just as before, um, click whichever response is applicable or most suitable for you, and then we'll see an overview of your responses. Good, so um, we see that most of you are um, have plans, so it's either uh, in, in the time between six uh, and 18 months or one and a half in three years, which is really nice to hear. And a uh, good thing is nobody is not planning it. So I'm assuming that everybody is convinced of the added value of a smart building. And this is uh, really good news for us. So, um, I would like to invite all the speakers again uh, to our Q&A session. I'm checking for some questions that are coming in, and please feel free if you have um, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Just put them in the in the chat, and I see that there are some coming in. Um, First question, why do multiple converged operational technology systems bring additional value and what are the challenges? Um, Mariana, of course, I think maybe this one's for you. Yeah, sure. Um, so if, if, if we, we want to think about understanding, let's say, let's think as a, a, a very simple uh, example. If you take, uh, a fire system in a hospital. Okay, let's think about a fire system in a hospital in a case of emergency. There is someone that is feeling very bad and needs to go to an emergency operation. 
I'm just giving an extreme example for us to understand it in a in an easy way. Um, as soon as that patient is now hello, as soon as that patient is now feeling well, um, the, there is a set of of uh, points that needs to, that that uh, things that needs to be done for the doctors to be able to save the life of that uh, of that person, and. If in the process you have the building helping you, it is a lot, a lot easier. So let's say that there is an emergency button, button in the room where the patient is and it, it triggers a, a blue code, which is the code that says the patient is in emergency. With that, let's think that a converged system could bring the elevator to that floor, could open the doors for the team to run in. I'm just, you know, giving an example. Um, could uh, prepare the room for the operation room theater to, for it to for the patients to be operated and so on and so forth. So you actually have different systems being converged into an outcome, and that is how we see that. Uh, why would that so important to have different systems working together and one adding information to the next one that would then allow it automatically to be controlled and um and 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 support the the decision taken within the building so um i think this is just a very simple example i said a fire system i wanted to give a different one but that of of, of this this example of lighting and elevator and um request control i think that that gives you a bit of a of an uh, of an idea how it it could look like what i what i could say to it is you know converged platforms just basically can mean faster outcomes you know often that because of being faster you know often actually at a lower cost for that outcome even using As well, fewer yeah. resources even using fewer resources you know even easier to maintain some of those processes and still be compliant so yeah, good, good point, Horst. Great, thanks. Um, uh, we have another question coming in. Um, thank you for the presentation. In Europe, what cyber regulations and laws do you see impacting the development of IoT and smart buildings? Can Can you repeat the question, Marianne? Sorry, I. In Europe, what cyber regulations and laws do you see impacting the development, uh, the deployment, sorry, of IoT and smart buildings? I don't know if this is for you or yeah, rather for him. I, I can yeah. take I can take that one uh, as well, uh, and I'll invite Horst to to comment and maybe Peter if he's uh, if he's uh, able. But one of the things that is very important to see to to say about the cyber and the data protection. I think that um, one of the things is about data protection and we understand and there is the data act uh, from the European Commission that um, says how important it is to protect the uh, people's data. But as Harry mentioned earlier, now with the current technology we have, we don't necessarily need to open the, uh, the, the 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 people's data so it, there is like let's say a, a mismatch if you if you if you try to understand technically we don't need to open up the the data but if you look at without understanding how technology works you might think okay that data act could be um could be uh, against a smart building but i don't see at the moment um to tell you the truth, I don't see at the moment any any regulation that would go against the de the deployment of a smart building. Um, I don't know, Harry, if you have uh, a, a, a different view on the cybersecurity part. I th it's a really good question. I think the biggest challenge I see on a almost I think day to day basis, a lot of it comes down to kind of network connectivity so whilst not directly related to regulation i think people are very concerned about how to connect these systems they're worried about devices you know joining the network so a lot of it comes down to you know following good network architecture and designing 
principles ultimately, but to your point around data privacy and GDPR, I think a lot of it is you have to really understand what you're, and I'd say this is most applicable to access control systems, but also occupancy measurement systems. You really have to understand how you're measuring users. Are you counting faces? Are you actually recording data on above desks? Is it processed on the device? Is it processed in the cloud? I think obviously that has massive implications and we do a lot of work in Central Europe where you know, we want a lot of that computation to happen on the device and not in the cloud where it's say hosted in the US or the UK or um, Asia, for example. So these are some of the challenges I think we need to face with in terms of how do we better use edge computing, not just to reduce costs and improve time, but actually mitigate any compliance concerns. Yeah, very good point. Very good point, Harry. And even though there may be regulations, I think it's of utmost importance in general to just avoid any kind of claims against yourself of, of liability, et cetera, that you really think of, of this at every level and that this unification of physical with digital you know, uh, technologies really requires embedded cybersecurity at every level from the, from the IoT device to the platform right from the start. So it's not just trying to achieve, you know, meeting regulation. It's really avoiding liability uh, just to maintain those big claims, as you can see, that could come your way if you're not. Yeah. Correct. Thank you, Horst. Yeah. Great. We have another one. Um, this one is a little bit shorter. How does AI influence your building interoperability? can take that up again. Um, um, AI is crucial. Um, and that, 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 that is what I like to reduce the answer to that, if I, if I might. <laughs> no, but I will uh, explain it a bit more. Um, AI allows you to take advantage of a whole amount of data. Analyze that very quickly, and, and, and it does what a human could not do and could bring outcomes and indication and feed into other parts of the systems to say, turn on your HVAC system, turn down or turn off your HVAC system and so on and so forth. For instance, if you think about a manufacturing site, um, you want to regulate how much you cool or how much you, uh, uh, yeah, you cool a, a certain a certain part or or the water for a certain part of the production, and and you want to regulate that based on outside temperature, based on inside the temperature inside, and um, and, and th that whole thing, uh, the 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 artificial intelligence allows you to take those to very quick decisions and make your system go in and out off so i think that artificial intelligence is there to bring the capability that we are not able to do on on a human base and allows your system to react much quicker to a system that does not contain artificial intelligence i don't know if, if that covers um but um but i would like to invite harry and horse to to contribute as well to the answer yeah, I can I can piggyback on that. I mean, to take advantage of all this data, there needs to be automated processes to analyze it and to make that analysis, you know, to perform tasks. As you said, you know, there's a certain fatigue to deal with so much data by individuals on an individual level. So it's about the right data to the right person at the right time, so people can do their jobs better. It's about accurate accuracy and false alarm avoidance. You know, it's to filter it and provide it to the right person. And that's going to elevate then that situational awareness and the best possible outcome that would otherwise not be as easy without artificial intelligence. So, so it's basically these data-driven decisions really surpass the ability of, of, of you know, like the, the personal or individual, the manual observation, you know, of, of us humans. So. Great. Okay, we still have one last uh, question and we still have a few minutes left. So 
um, we can still answer this one. How do you stay up to date related to cybersecurity threats and what are the bottlenecks? Fantastic question. I love that question because we didn't have time to cover that, that perspective of it. Um, uh, let's say that Johnson Controls is, is a, a full provider and all our solutions are tested. Um, so we basically have a group of hackers, if, if you'd like to think about it, we, we've got a group of hackers that try to hack in our own system before we release the, the solutions. So basically what we do is, as soon as we develop uh, the products and so on, we have a we have internal proofing team that goes continuously on our system and tries to, to breach the system all the time. And, as soon as you have it breach proofed, then we are able to offer that to our customers. So that's basically in a very simple manner how we are able to, um, to cover um, that, uh, that perspective from the cybersecurity. Obviously, um, as soon as a possible breach is identified, we, um, we work with, we work constantly and it's 24 seven because we've got uh, groups around the globe working on cybersecurity. So it is on uh, America's uh, time zone, it is on European time zone, and it is on Asia's time zone. And it, all those teams are working on 24 7 scale to allow us to maintain that, that uh, 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 management and that yeah, monitoring of our systems to maintain them uh, updated. So I think that that brings a bit of an overview how um, how serious we take the cybersecurity part. Good. So yeah, I think that was the last question. There's nothing more coming in. Um, with that, I think um, it just stays to say thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for joining. Um, and also, of course, a very big thank you to Harry um, for giving us uh, some of his precious time. And um, same goes to you, Mariana and Horst, of course. Um, thanks for giving us this insight. Uh, we will, as said, uh, we will send out this recording to everybody. So if you were not able to watch the whole recording, don't worry, we'll, we cover you there. And uh, you can share that, of course, with your colleagues. So um, I think there's nothing much more to say than um, I want to wish you, and from, from all of us, I think uh, we would like to wish you already a very nice holidays and a very nice good start into the new year. Um, we hope that we can continue with our power sessions uh, in, the, in the upcoming year as well. Um, so again, thank you everybody for joining and have a good weekend already. Thank, thank you. you, Mariam. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care.